So uh, continuing with the uh, RTC trend, Lorenzo is going to be talking to us about uh, putting some web in your RTC SIP with JS. Yeah. Can you hear me or is it still muted? Little we'll switch on top. On top? Working now? Bring the mic closer. You mind? Move the mic up. Better? Can you hear me? A little yeah. higher. <laughs> okay. Talk. Should, okay, should be. Is it better now? Beautiful. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks for the introduction, and, and I'm really glad to be here again. I mean, it's my fourth, fourth edition of OpenZips. I'm never tired of you guys. I'm really glad that you're having me here. <laughs> you were here the first year, were you not? Um, I don't think so, no. I, I think... Are you hotel? No, yeah, no, no, this is my fourth time. I, I'm pretty right, sure I guess, of that. I, I guess you're the, <laughs> you're the master. Not but I'm looking forward to, my, to the fifth next year, so who knows? Yeah. Fingers crossed. We'll be, hey, 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 we'll be here. Don't worry. No, no, fingers crossed that you're oh, like, like Yeah, no, okay. exactly. <laughs> Many, many, many blessings to your breathing. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> and yeah, the idea was to talk about this stuff, but then I said, why not talk about the last episode of Game of Thrones <laughs> instead? <laughs> okay, let's not go there. So <laughs> a few words about me. So I'm Lorenzo Minier. I got my PhD at the University of Napoli, which is also where uh, Miteco, the company I work for, uh, was, was born. And these are my contacts over here. You can find some, some of my older talks on this slide share link, including some of the, the talks that I made the past year at, at OpenSIPS itself. And just a couple of words on, on our company. We are a very small company based in the south of Italy, in Napoli, and we do the usual stuff like consulting, commercial support, and things like this on, uh, on Janus. And this is where we are based. So as you can see, a very pretty, pretty view. Our office is around, around the left area. And, Take, a, take a note of that castle over there because it will come back before the end of the presentation. So first of all, why, um, why am I making this talk? So there are many reasons why you may want to, to have SIP and WebRTC work, work together. So first of all, I mean, uh, you all have a SIP infrastructure for one reason or another, and you, you put a lot of money in it, and you, want, and you want it to stay there. You want to keep on using it, which makes a lot of sense. And as we've seen in the last presentation by Saul, it's, it's getting easier and easier to write new clients using WebRTC stacks, up to the point where it's actually, be, it's actually becoming easier to write a WebRTC client, for instance, a mobile WebRTC client, than it is to write a SIP client instead in, uh, for, for mobile instead. And so uh, it makes sense to try and see if the two can actually cooperate together. And luckily enough, as we'll see, it's not that easy, but SIP and WebRTC are similar enough that a gatewaying functionality between the two is hard, but it's, it's not impossible. And there are many reasons why it may, makes sense. The first one that comes to mind is the old uh, PSTN integration scenario. So you want to, uh, to call your grandma from, from your browser, which is always cool, or, or of course, uh, use cases that are more uh, interesting than that. And one of those may be contact centers. And there are really a lot of benefits why you may want a WebRTC access to your contact center. So, uh, it may be because it's much easier for your customers to get in touch. Rather than picking up their phone and finding the right number and calling, you can just put a button on your website and they can get in touch with an agent right away. It makes remotizing agents really very easy as well because you don't need to have uh, a whole bunch of people in the same building answering phone calls and so on. They can, can all work from home as long as they have a browser, for instance, or your own application. And while this makes things easier, if you are able to reuse the existing infrastructure that you have, and still take advantage of those things, it's actually a, a huge benefit. You save a lot of money in, with that. And of course, there are other use cases. Uh, I'm mentioning conferencing here just because it's a, uh, it's a common use case, but there are many reasons why it may make sense. So for instance, to do some kind of hybrid conferencing where you have video for WebRTC users, but you still use uh, SIP-based audio in order to interact, for instance, with the PSTN users that we mentioned before so that they can still participate in a conference somehow. Of course, this requires some way of getting SIP and WebRTC to talk to each other and try adding WebRTC support to, to this. I mean, it's, uh, it's not really that easy. So sometimes you, you are actually working with black boxes. So uh, not everything is open source. Sometimes you have components like SBCs or whatever that are not easy to modify in order to add the WebRTC stack to that. Or maybe your devices are, are not compliant with that stuff. So you want 
uh, WebRTC browsers to talk to phones like these, you need something uh, that actually takes care of that. And so if we want to figure out how exactly SIP and WebRTC look alike, this is a, a common uh, diagram of how actually WebRTC, a WebRTC setup works. And you can see it's very similar to the famous SIP trapezoid that you've seen pretty much everywhere in, in all the lessons on SIP. So you have some signaling that goes across uh, a signaling server and then media ends up being peer-to-peer. -peer. The difference with SIP is that I explicitly mentioned just the generic signaling there. I've not put SIP because WebRTC doesn't mandate any signaling at all if you didn't know this already. So this can be a custom protocol based on JSON. It can be uh, XMPP, it can be SIP, it can be whatever you want. It's not mandated to be anything at all. It does use SDP even if it's a bit uh, some sort of SDP on steroids because WebRTC added a lot of stuff on that as we see, as we'll see in a few slides. And the media though is the hardest part because typically with SIP infrastructures you have either plain RTP or you have possibly R SRTP using SDS as a key exchange. With, uh, with WebRTC, you are mandated to use ICE as a way to actually find a communication path between the two peers. You have to use DTLS as a way to exchange keys. You, are, you cannot use SDS, it's mandated not to be used. And of course, you are required to use SRTP as well. So all of those three may actually uh, be a bit at odds with actually how most SIP infrastructure exists today. And if we actually want to have a look at the whole WebRTC protocol suite, you can can be pretty scary because there are a lot of things that you have to worry about. As we've said, uh, SDP and RTP are there, so we shouldn't worry too much. I mean, uh, gatewaying should be uh, doable between the WebRTC and the SIP world. Some, some endpoints and some CPU infrastructures may do SRTP, as we've said. They may have some sort of uh, uh, ICE-based NAT traversal as well. But as I've said, most definitely they don't have DTLS, which is uh, pretty much recent. Uh, the signaling protocol is, uh, is something that you should take care of, and there are some problems possibly related to codex, even though most of the cases um, that's, that's not really needed. The real point is that WebRTC can get really scary if you have a look at all of those things, so having to worry about all of that yourself can be problematic. Luckily enough, most of the times you don't need to do that because, uh, as we've said, uh, WebRTC is typically a peer-to-peer -peer kind of uh, technology. So you have two peers uh, exchanging some information and then create a session between each other. But this doesn't mean that one of the peers can't actually be an application. So it can be a WebRTC server, for instance, a WebRTC gateway of sorts, which means that this component can take care of whatever is needed on the other side. So if we collapse the two features, if we imagine a component that does both signaling and media uh, media termination in order to do all the things that a WebRTC endpoint is supposed to do, then there's really no limits to what you can do. So you can definitely interact with the SIP infrastructure. So this component may take care of talking SIP on the other end, uh, uh, sending and receiving RTP packets in a way that the infrastructure is comfortable in receiving, while on the other side talking WebRTC. But it can be also, I don't know, interacting with other technologies like RTSP. So for instance, you, want, you have a security camera that is based on RTSP and you want to watch it from, from your browser instead. This is something else that a component like this can do. Or any other kind of technology that, that has been out there for, for a long time, like RTMP or Silverlight or whatever, that you still want to expose somehow via WebRTC. And this is actually where uh, what Janus fits in the picture. So. Uh, Janus is uh, a WebRTC server that we designed. It's completely open source. You can find some links over there. There's the GitHub repo, some demos and documentation that you can play with if you're curious about it, and also a link to our Google group. So there is an active community that daily exchanges ideas and feedback and so on. And at the beginning, our main uh, purpose was exactly this kind of gatewaying functionality that we've seen in the previous slides, so something like this. Lately, uh, we've moved more from more to a more generic WebRTC server approach, meaning that you can do also conferencing, broadcasting, whatever that never leaves the WebRTC world per se. But the gateway functionality is something that is still very much alive in Janus, mostly because we see Janus as a WebRTC enabler for several kind of technologies that didn't uh, were not uh, theoretically conceived to be aware of WebRTC at all. So. We do our best to make sure that these services, these infrastructures don't need to know that there is a WebRTC implementation that is actually talking to them. We make this pretty much transparent to them. That's, that's the main idea. 
And the way it works is that we have all the WebRTC stack, so all that scary slide that you saw before, is actually implemented in the core. So in the, in the core, we implement all the WebRTC stacks, so ICE, DTLS, data channels, a simulcast, all of, those, all of those nice features. Everything else is basically a plugin. It's a modular architecture, so we have different plugins implementing different transports. By transports, I mean really the transport protocol that takes care, the application level protocol that takes care of the Janus API. So you can use REST, WebSockets, or, or Unix sockets, MQTT, whatever you like, and more can be added later on. But most importantly also the application logic, so how you handle the streams, how you receive streams, what you do with the media streams that you are receiving from browsers, what do you send back, is actually part of the application logic. So we have different plugins that actually take care of different things. We have the plugins that can do conferencing a bit like Jitsi does, as uh, Saul was describing previously. We have a, a plugin for SIP, as we'll see in a minute, a plugin for broadcasting and things like this. So it means this, it's really flexible, extensible. Anytime a new use case comes to mind that is not possible via Janus right now, we can add the new plugin to take care of that. And some companies have also written their own plugins for their own purposes, which was kind of interesting. And yeah, really the idea is that these plugins that I've introduced are basically just bricks. So you can bind them together in an application perspective and you use them together. So you can use the C plugin and the conferencing plugin together to do, for instance, uh, a web conference where video is only seen by uh, WebRTC participants, for instance, but for audio we all fall back to the to a SIP conference bridge instead, which makes makes things easier uh, for for a large for a larger uh, attendance, basically. And this is all made possible, as again, by this kind of uh, modular architecture where we basically. Uh, each peer connection can be attached to one or different plugins, and each, each of these plugins can handle this media differently. And this is, of course, made possible by the fact that each plugin implements its own sub-protocol, so its own API. So it's really easy to, to write your own plugin, write your own requests, commands, and so on, so that they can do something that Janus by itself cannot instead. And as I was saying, SIP was actually a first-class citizen in Janus. It's been really there uh, since day one. It was one of the main reasons why we started working on on Janus in the first place at the time. We also have a demo available if you want to play with it. You'll see that it's very, very simply a, a very bare-bone SIP soft phone. You, you insert some data like the server you want to register to, the credentials. You can also join as a guest if your infrastructure allows for it. And then you can uh, generate or receive calls via WebRTC, just as simple as that. So it should it should work if you if you give it a try. So. And the idea is that this kind of plugin is basically just a very simple WebRTC to from gateway, so to from SIP gateway. So it allows you to interact with the SIP infrastructure by, of course, having WebRTC on one side. So on the between the browser and Janus, you talk WebRTC. Between the Janus SIP plugin and the SIP infrastructure, you talk SIP. And so this this plugin acts as a gateway both for signaling and for media, especially. And more importantly, uh, and this is uh, important to point out because it's uh, one of the, the points where people have the most doubts about so when they think uh, about what the C plugin does, the C plugin is really just a C pen point on behalf of the user. So uh, in the demo that I mentioned before where I said you can put in your credentials, the, the zip server to register to and so on and so forth, Anytime that you start using that demo, actually a SIP stack is created within the SIP plugin. So basically we create a SIP stack, a SIP client within the SIP plugin that generates and, and takes care of all the SIP signaling on your behalf within the plugin. So this plugin is not a SIP proxy, it's not a PBX, it's just, just really see it as a regular endpoint that sits within Janus. And so that is basically a SIP endpoint on behalf of the remote WebRTC user instead. In fact, the remote user never sees SIP at all. They just see very simple JSON messages going back and forth. They want to call somebody, they send a request call uh, URI, and they tell the SIP URI they want to call. And then it's actually the SIP plugin, the SIP stack that lives there, that actually originates the invite and takes care of all the exchanges there, which is um, really flexible in that case. We don't do any transcoding within the plugin as well, which is also important. So any RTP packet that we receive from WebRTC, we send exactly the same way on the SIP side. Of course, it will be either plain RTP or it will be SRTP if SDS is in use, but the media stays the same. We don't do any transcoding. So if you do need that, uh, you, you should probably rely 
uh, you should rely on the help of a component like free switch or asterisk or whatever to do that so you can put uh, your uh, the browser calling Janus, Janus in front of OpenZip, for instance, OpenZip in front of asterisk or free switch and things like this. And uh, another interesting feature is that we also have built-in recording where we basically save the separate media legs of the call for, for each of the calls. It's of course not ad as advanced as, the, as what we've seen in the presentation by Bruno before, but for most use cases it does fit uh, the needs. And uh, it's important, uh, all of these steps are important because they do simplify the life for web developers because you, you don't have to forget that most web developers don't really have, are not really familiar with SIP, which can be really complicated. So they don't really have to worry about SIP because as I said, the users never see SIP in their own stack. They only possibly see SIP URIs. You can still inject some headers if you want. So this is something that we allow. So if you have custom headers that you want to, have to, to appear in the SIP requests that we originate, you can do that. But apart from that, we really just have some basic methods to, to start to send requests, some basic events to, to notify you, for instance, about incoming calls and stuff like this, but nothing more than that. So it's really just as simple as you see it there. So generic signaling over there, WebRTC stuck here, generic SIP interaction with the SIP infrastructure instead. And um, there are, let's say, um, there are many reasons why, at least in our opinion, it makes sense to uh, not have uh, SIP in the browser. I mean, uh, I mean, you're probably familiar with uh, several use cases where uh, uh, SIP is used over web sockets, for instance. I think OpenSIP exposes a functionality like this. Uh, I explained how instead in the general C plugin we do everything in SIP internally instead. We don't really expose anything except a, a very basic JSON-based API. And this is something that we do on purpose, mostly because, first of all, we want to, to, to take into account infrastructures that are completely clueless about WebRTC. So they may not even know that the, uh, the, the invite is coming from a WebRTC endpoint. Since we are originating the invite and we may be sending it in the clear over UDP, uh, it's, bas it's just as if a regular endpoint was sending a, a SIP invite instead. Uh, it can be problematic to handle a whole SIP stack on the client side, for instance, in the browser, mostly because uh, it's, it's easy to manipulate those requests to, to make lo them look like they really shouldn't. Uh, as I said, it makes life easier for web developers in general because working with JSON is much easier than actually keeping track of the uh, life cycle of a, of a, SIP, of a SIP interaction. Uh, Besides, this kind of, of wrapping of, of SIP also, let's say, helps you protecting from well-known attacks because in this case, in this case uh, you can much more easily make assumptions on the traffic. If most of the requests will come from Janus, you know exactly how those requests will look like. So you really don't have to worry about people injecting or manipulating the SIP messages to make your infrastructure crash, basically. You are, let's say, a bit more protected, protected in that sense. And of course, you also hide completely the, the, the topology of the SIP infrastructure without having to do anything uh, with respect to that. Mostly because, as I said, the clients never see SIP at all, so they, can really, they cannot really have a look at the, at, the ex at the messages exchanged to figure out how to, to exploit some of your, of your issues, basically. And uh, this is really how it looks like from a kind of flow diagram. As really simply, uh, we we send some very basic messages using JSON, and this translates to, to SIP request. In this case, uh, it's a SIP register, a regular refresh of that registration as well, which is done transparently. How you can send an invite or how you can handle an incoming invite. As you can see here, here uh, the, the stack is keeping on receiving and handling the SIP transactions. Any, anytime we receive an incoming invite, we notify the user so that the user can decide whether they want to accept it or not but we notify it basically by, via a simple JSON exchange, nothing more than, than that. You may want to still use uh, SIP uh, in the browser instead for one reason or another, and in that case, you cannot use the, um, the, the SIP plugin. You have to use a different uh, plugin uh, instead, which is called NoSIP, which is actually uh, something that uh, Saul uh, advised um, some years ago. He suggested a plugin that could do something like this, and eventually I ended up implementing it. And it's basically, just as the name says, it doesn't contain any SIP at all. So it just takes care of uh, translating, gatewaying the media part of the, uh, of the communication while it leaves signaling completely up to the application instead, which means that 
the idea is basically whenever your browser uh, originates something that you want to be an invite, they will generate a WebRTC SDP, so something that a regular device will not be able to digest. So what you, what you do is you take this WebRTC SDP, you pass it to Janus, Janus will give you back a vanilla SDP if you like, so something that a regular device can handle, and that's what you put in your invite instead. You receive a response with a vanilla SDP, you pass it back to Janus, Janus gives you back a WebRTC SDP, and that's what you give the browser instead. So basically, you take care of the SIP signaling, you just take care of switching the SDPs uh, in, uh, in the request so that you make both parties happy. And then eventually the, the WebRTC user will talk to Janus and Janus will take care of gatewaying this media to the legacy device instead. So really, you can see it as an RTP proxy kind of thing, but mostly for WebRTC purposes. And this is basically how it works. So very much as I just said, you, you just involve the Janus plugin for the purpose of translating this uh, WebRTC SDP to a vanilla SDP and vice versa and then you take care of uh, the, uh, using the right as, uh, SDP in the SIP transactions yourself, basically. And this is the same thing for incoming, uh, incoming requests, of course. So you may be wondering at this point uh, how much uh, this all scales, and this was actually the, the main topic of a talk that I did last year at ComCon. Um, you can see a video over there if you're more interested in this. It's, it covers more the scalability of Janus in general, but I had more, uh, some considerations on SIP as well. In general, and you, oh, there are also some papers that you can read if you want to have more information, but it actually scales quite well because, most, first of all, the load increase in Janus is pretty much linear when it comes to the SIP plugin, mostly because, as I said, we don't do any transcoding, so we don't have to worry about that. And we are just have to worry really about the, the bandwidth that we use, not even the CPU is that much of an issue. It can become an issue and you handle a lot of calls, but uh, for, for the most part, the bandwidth is the real problem, which means it's really an increase, a linear increase instead. And another important property is that uh, callers and callee are really independent of each other as far as Janus is concerned. So, you don't really need, uh, if for instance you have two WebRTC users that are calling to each, uh, that are calling each other via SIP but uh, using WebRTC, uh, you don't need them to be on the same Janus instance because uh, it's not actually Janus that ties them from a logical perspective, it's the, the SIP infrastructure that does. So you can have uh, the caller connected to Janus number 5 and the call lead that is actually connected to Janus number 23 they still are able to, come to, to talk to each other because eventually uh, the SIP invite uh, gets to the right place and the media is actually bridged between the two Janus instances automatically via these SIP interactions. So, which means that pretty much you can handle any call in a really independent way. And considering that it's really easy to spawn new instances on a per need basis, it means that uh, designing the scalability of your Janus-based infrastructure is quite easy when it comes to SIP because you can just deploy as many instances as you need depending on a provisioning that you make and any time that you find out that you need more you just spawn more instances and you just make sure that these new instances are part of whatever load balancing that you have in place for the WebRTC part. Really it's just as easy as that when it comes to the WebRTC side of things. So of course you need to worry about the scalability of your SIP infrastructure, but for the WebRTC part you don't have to worry too much because the, you have those, these properties that are really quite helpful. And of course there are different strategies that you can follow when doing load balancing for, for WebRTC using Janus, because for instance you may just have, assuming that these are Janus instances and these are the proxies that sit in front of them in order to handle the web traffic, for instance if you are using rest of web sockets to communicate, you may have the clients that are aware of the fact that there are multiple Janus instances and so leave the choice up to them to where which one they should use. Uh, you can actually make this choice as part of a load balancing uh, logic within, uh, within a proxy sitting in front of both, which can be as simple as a round robin for instance or it can be a geo-based distribution. So this, uh, this call comes from Brazil, you know that you have to pick a server in South America, for instance, because it's closer to the user. Or you can, uh, you can also implement some sort of a wrapper of the Janus API itself, so that uh, the, the end user not only does not see SIF, but it doesn't even see the Janus API. It uses a completely custom API that you have for more control, for, for, for preventing people to actually abuse the service and not do things they are not supposed to do. 
you can implement some sort of uh, media resource brokering where you have some sort of an index of these wrappers so that you you, you do a mix of the, uh, the things that you see over there. I mean, you can really do a lot of things uh, from a scalability side of things. It's really up to uh, how you want to, to orchestrate uh, all of these. Most importantly, uh, I mean, you, you're probably all familiar with Homer, and you're, you'll be glad to know that this works, this works really nice with Homer. This comes from, uh, this is a picture from last year presentation that Lorenzo actually created when, when we wrote and we worked on the presentation together, where I actually presented how you can use uh, Janus as a source of events for Homer and for Epic in order to do all the kind of monitoring and troubleshooting of whatever happens in Janus in Homer itself. So if you're already using Homer in your own infrastructure, Janus would be a, another source of events that you can consume pretty much the same way. So just to conclude also, because I, I think I'm almost, almost uh, 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 my time is almost over, the C plugin is basically complete and it's used in production by a lot of uh, companies already. Of course, we are, we are never happy. We always want to improve things and we already thought of some enhancements that might make sense. So one thing that is missing that may be a deal breaker for some of you is that we currently don't support uh, cold transfers. So either it's blind or attended transfers, we don't support them yet. So at the moment, companies who need them typically rely on a PBX to help with that. Uh, if this is something that is really needed, this should be actually be uh, implemented. We haven't had time for that yet because we, first of all, we first need to figure out which which kind of transfer is the the one that actually most people uh, end up using. We don't want to implement too much stuff, so that might be useful. We want to increment security possibly via authenticated headers, and this is something that uh, some uh, some third party already started contributing as a pull request. We, a SIP trunking is something that we also are considering, mostly because, as I've explained, we are basically each user that connects has a different SIP and SIP stack within the plugin. It may have sense to just have a single SIP stack instead that takes care of all the incoming calls and outgoing calls, which would also uh, prevent the need for registrations in the first place. So if we know that Lorenzo at Miteco.com is sitting on this Janus instance, I don't really need to register as long as an incoming invite for Lorenzo at Miteco.com is it gets to the right instance, I can take care of the call that way. We may want to have multiple calls on the same peer connection, which is something that we don't currently do. For instance, like the classic secretary that handles multiple calls at the same time and can switch uh, between them at any point. Of course, you would need all, all of the calls to have the same codec in place for this to work, but this is an idea. And, and lawful interception is also something that we are considering because it's always it's often asked. I mean, we have some ideas on, on how to implement that, but it's not there yet. But really, most importantly, I really would just wanted to share the, uh, what the C plugin is with, uh, with you guys, just so that if you find that, uh, if you find it, it's an interesting idea and you may want to have a look at it, uh, we'd be glad to, uh, to help you uh, put it in place, basically. And really, this, uh, this is all. I'm just, just for a few seconds to, to conclude. I mean, uh, we are going to have the very first Janus conference in a few months in Napoli, in the south of Italy. I mean, uh, as I said, this is my third year here, and I really love the, the spirit of the community anytime that I come to events like this. And I really wanted to have something similar for Janus as well. That it seems to work really well for Open Sips, and I want to. I wanted to, to see if we could get the same kind of benefit. So if you're interested in WebRTC, the call for paper is still open for, this, for a, a month or so. We have an early bird registration and so on. And most importantly, Napoli in September is really beautiful. It's summer, but without all the crowds. So you can really get, you can, it, it really can go wrong. And as I, was, as I was promising, this is the castle that I was showing in the first picture. And we are really in front of that with the hotel. So we are really on the sea which also explains the VoIP on the beach event that we are level there. So that's all, I believe. I don't know if we will have time for questions, but thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorenzo. Do we have any questions? Come on, don't be shy. Put those hands up. We won't smell your armpits. Wow, you were thorough. Everyone is well informed. Or maybe nobody understood a single thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know, they're a bunch of amateurs. So. <laughs> or maybe I spoke too fast. I mean, I tend to do that. No, I understood you. <laughs> and uh, I'm not an amateur, so yeah, we've but, set the baseline. But you're Nobody Greek. asked for but your opinion. <laughs> we already, we're listening to one Italian. Just because you share nationality doesn't mean it's your turn to speak. 
<laughs> okay, so we have no questions for him. Let's give him one more round of applause. Lorenzo, thank you. thank you so much.